This is a shelter. And uh, I'm so happy that you're all here, especially Leda's family. It's so nice, you know, that, that they all came out, the whole family, and, and they don't live right close by. And uh, it's an awesome thing. Psalm 61 says this, For thou hast been a shelter for me, and a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covert of thy wings. Would you bow your heads with me? Dear Lord, we thank you for this gathering. We thank you for our baptizees today. We thank you for their family. We thank you for this event, Lord, that you cleared up the water so we could have this, that you held off the rain today, and that you've given us a beautiful day, that it's cool, it's delightful, and you, Lord, are cool, and you are so delightful, and we're just happy that you're here today, and that you've given us this word to share, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we're in a shelter. Last year, it rained during our church service in the shelter, it rained. And I was, I was standing right on the edge. I got wet in the back a little bit, but we're dry. We're dry today. And uh, when we reserve a shelter for an event like this, there's no telling if it's going to rain. We don't know what's going to happen. But we have a roof just in case. Unfortunately, this shelter can't protect us from bugs. <laughs> I only saw one, ye one yellow jacket inside here. This is a bad year for yellow jackets. But at my house, bugs, yellow jackets, I call them back porch demons. <laughs> They're seeking shelter in my house. But I got the best of them. I killed about 300 of them so far. I think I got rid of mine too. Good, okay. because they're all over. But the bees are trying to get shelter in the house and in the porches and in places like this but we need shelter from the bees <laughs> so we have a conflict but ultimately we will win against those back porch demons those little bugs <laughs> life is full of conflicts threats battles if you've been on the planet as long as some of us have. I might be the longest on the planet here today. But as long as some of us have, you can agree that the path of life is littered with conflict. Moses had conflict even from his own brother and sister. Did you know that? Numbers chapter 12, Miriam and Aaron. Miriam, by the way, was the older sister. She was the one that put him in a basket of reeds and floated him in the, in the, put him in a basket and floated him in among the reeds in the Nile. But this is after they left Egypt and Mary, Miriam and Aaron began to talk against Moses because of his Cushite wife, for he had married a Cushite. Well, they didn't like him marrying a Cushite. Cush is today's Somalia. And Moses was married to Zipporah, the daughter of Jethro, the priest of Midian. Now we don't know if the Cushite was uh, Zipporah or if he married another one. We don't know. We don't know. But for some reason they didn't like that he married a Cushite wife and they were complaining against him about that. So when they said that, when they said that, they said, has the Lord spoken only through Moses? They said, hasn't he also spoken through us? I wonder who they were talking to. Who were they saying that to? You can be thinking out loud or talking quietly to yourself, but God hears. God hears. He can decipher your thoughts. We hide nothing from God. And the Lord heard this. The Lord heard it. Continuing in verse 4, And once the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, he said, Come to the tent of meeting, all three of you. So God ordered them to come into his presence. So the three of them went out. Then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud 
he stood at the entrance to the tent and summoned Aaron and Miriam. They were in a little bit of trouble here. When the two of them stepped forward, he said, listen to my words. When there's a prophet among you, I, the Lord, reveal myself to them in visions. I speak to them in dreams, but this is not true of my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak face to face, clearly and not in riddles. He sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? The anger of the Lord burned against them, and he left them. Then, as you know, and the rest of the story goes, that Miriam was afflicted with leprosy for a time to teach her a lesson. God himself sheltered Moses from the conflict. We're talking about shelter today. How about Abraham? Waited till he was a hundred to have a son with Sarah that God had promised. And then God, in a supreme test, asked him to sacrifice his son Isaac. In obedience, Abraham set out to do it. But God stopped him. It was just a test of his faith. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as, his, as righteousness. God always sheltered Abraham. We're talking about shelter today. David's life was a series of conflicts. King Saul tried to kill him. Twice in the palace he threw a spear at him, tried to stick him to the wall. His armies chased after him. Even David's own son Absalom tried to dethrone and kill him. 2 Samuel 22, 1-3, David sang to the Lord the words of this song when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. He said, this was David's song, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield, and the horn of my salvation. He is my stronghold, my refuge, and my savior. From violent people, you save me. So God was a shelter for David. We're talking about shelter today. Continuing in uh, 2 Samuel 22 and 17 to 18, he reached down from on high and took hold of me. He drew me out of deep waters. He rescued me from my powerful enemy, from my foes who were too strong for me. In Jesus' time, the Pharisees were in such conflict with him that they demanded that Pilate sentence him to be crucified. Jesus didn't take shelter. He didn't take shelter. He is our shelter because he didn't take shelter because he went to the cross and suffered and died to pay the penalty for our sins. One time the disciples needed Jesus to be their shelter. In Matthew chapter 14, starting at verse 22, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone. This isn't the time that Jesus was asleep in the boat. This is a different one because he wasn't in the boat at this time. These storms were common on the Sea of Galilee and even though some of his disciples were fishermen, they were mariners, they were used to being in storms and on the sea, but they didn't have storm warnings in those days. Notice that Jesus made them get into the boat and go. Notice also that Jesus had a vantage point from the mountaintop where he was. He could see them struggling. What did they need? Shelter. <laughs> see, they could only see the form of him. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost. They said and cried out in fear, but they could only see the form of him. There was so much spray and wind, they couldn't see clearly. 
So it made it hard to see that it was actually Jesus. But in verse 27, Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, remember this was in the middle of a storm. He was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Have you ever been in a storm, an emotional storm, a financial storm, a life storm, and you start toward God and you look around and see what's happening to you? Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. And those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. See, Jesus sent his disciples into that storm. He made them get in a boat, and he said, Go. It says he made them get into the boat and go. He sent them into the storm. Jesus may be sending you somewhere. He does that. He knew they could handle a boat. In the storm, all they needed was to have Jesus in the boat with them. I want Jesus to be in my boat. He sees me from afar, but he is near, right beside me. He knows what I'm going through. He knows what you're going through. He knows where it hurts. He knows when it hurts. For me, the only time it doesn't hurt is when I'm in the recliner. <laughs> when he tells me to get into a boat, I'm going to get in. He told me to come to this church, I went. When he tells me go, I'm going to go. We should all be like that. Layla came to church. I couldn't just let her go without seeing if she would accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. That was a go from God. Bert came the following week and Jesus said, go. She's going to get saved. Go to her. That was a go from God. I don't mean there's a voice that comes into my ear and says go. It's a spiritual perception. But when he says go, I must obey. Someone's soul hangs in the balance. Am I talking about boats and lakes? Am I talking about wind and waves? Not literally. But there are storms to encounter in serving God. Paul had a whole list of storms that he faced. He had a whole list of them. God was with him. And even when they beheaded him, God sheltered him and he entered the eternal shelter of God's home in heaven. I have to share the gospel. I have to. I'm driven to do that. And believers are. Believers are called to do that. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. All have sinned yes. and come short yes. of God's glory. That's me and you and everybody that ever walked on the planet. And, but then in 6.23 of Romans it says, For the wages of sin is death. And that means eternal separation from God or hell's fire. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So if I'm a sinner, which I am, deserving death or separation from God, how can I get the gift of God, which is eternal life? How can I move from being a sinner, guilty, and condemned to get the blessing of eternal life? How can I do that? Jesus came to Nicodemus came to Jesus with that same question, and Jesus answered him. In John chapter 3, and starting verse 3, he said, Jesus replied, Verily I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone 
be born when they're old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb and be born. And Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and of the Spirit. The first time you're born, you're born of water. You're in water, amniotic fluid in your mother. The second time, you're born of the Spirit. That's a, an experience that comes this way. John 1.12 says, To all who received him, even to those that believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. You become God's child. That's what happens when you ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. You're born again. You're forgiven. Jesus suffered and died on the cruel cross of Calvary to pay the penalty for my sins and for yours and for every sin that was committed ever. He took all the sins upon the cross so we wouldn't have to. And all we have to do is believe and receive. He came to set us free from the law of sin and death. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. If you're born again, God is our ultimate shelter. We'll talk about shelters today. His protection will follow us, and then he will take us into glory. Think of it. We get to move in with God. He's making a place for us in heaven. Amen. One day each of us will come before God. He's either going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Or he will say, depart from me. I never knew you. Abraham was called to go into a land he didn't know. His faith in God was his shelter. He said, go into a place I will show you. He didn't know the culture, didn't know the language, didn't know the people, didn't know anything. But he just went. God was his shelter, his faith. Moses was called to lead a nation to the promised land. He wasn't prepared to do that. At this time, he was just a shepherd. His shelter was the presence of God that went with him. David faced threats. His shelter was the presence of God. Paul had many, many trials, threats, difficulty. His shelter was the presence of God. We as born-again believers have an enemy. The enemy doesn't want anyone to get saved. He doesn't want anybody to be born again. He wants you dead and in hell. That's what our enemy wants. Our shelter, then, is to be born again, to be born of the Spirit, to become a child of God. When we face challenges and battles, we find solace in knowing that God is our shelter. He's our place of refuge and safety, providing strength and protection against the attacks of the enemy. Just as a strong tower offers security from physical harm, God's presence serves as our spiritual shelter. In Psalm 6, 61, From the ends of the earth I call to you, I call as my heart grows faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. That rock is Jesus. For you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the foe. That foe is the devil, the enemy. I long to dwell in your tent forever. That's heaven. And take refuge in the shelter of your wings. Do you need it? Do we be in shelter? Do you need to be in the shelter of God's wings today? Do you, do you need to be, do you need to have Jesus? Maybe, maybe there's someone here that never asked Jesus to be Lord and Savior, doesn't have that born-again experience. 
like Layla did a couple weeks ago. It was an exciting time for me as a person who carries the gospel. And I asked her if she wanted to accept Jesus as Savior. She said, yes, I do. The three most important and exciting words a soul winner could ever hear is, yes, I do. Is there anybody in the shelter here today that would say, yes, I do, to that question? I'm going to ask that you all just bow your heads and close your eyes for a minute. And just think about your own self. Do you need Jesus? Maybe you've never had the born again experience. Maybe, you know, maybe you've, you've never had that. Maybe the Holy Spirit is speaking to you today and saying, you need, you need to pray that prayer and accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. And if that's you, I'm not going to ask you to stand up, raise your hand, or anything else. I'm just going to ask you to look up at me and you have eye contact and then close your eyes again. Is there anyone in the house that needs to ask Jesus to be Lord and Savior? So just look at me with your eyes. Anybody? Well, then I must assume that we're all born again believers in the house today, which is an awesome thing. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen. Amen. Life is hard, but God is good. Lord, it's been good to be in your shelter today. And in this shelter today, it's been good to be with like-minded, loving Christian believers. It's, it's been good, Lord. We love you today, Lord. Ganarunkwa, that's I love you in Mohawk, Indian language. Ganarunkwa, we love you, Lord. So, Lord, as we conclude our service, we pray your blessings on each person here in the homes and households they represent. And um, we pray that you will bless these refreshments, Lord, this meal and the fellowship with it. To our hearts, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So I'm going to ask...